All right, how you guys doing? My name is Raymond. Um, I, uh, I'm just trying to make sure everything works. Okay, cool. Um, my name is Raymond. I'm a nurse over at Chandler Regional Medical Center. I work in trauma ICU. Um, I'm looking to get into uh, CRNA school, so I decided to do the physics of anesthesia for my topic here. So, oh, that's my little tribe there. <laughs> that's why I do what I do. All right, so what exactly is anesthesia? There's really um, three main types of anesthesia. Sorry. There's like really three main types of anesthesia. Uh, there's local anesthesia, which, um, which is like, you hear about like lidocaine or that just basically blocks the nerves from being able to sense pain. It happens at the nerve receptors and stuff. Um, and that happens by changing the potential energy and whatnot. Um, and then there's uh, regional, um, there's regional anesthesia, which is like the same thing, but just for a bigger part of the body, uh, like you, like epidurals that women get for for having babies and stuff. But really, when people are thinking of uh, anesthesia, they're thinking of general anesthesia. Um, so what general anesthesia is is um, basically four main components. It's a profound unconsciousness. Um, you are without pain. You are um, amnestic, meaning you're unable to form memories, and you're completely paralyzed. So because of that, you're pretty heavily monitored. Um, it's, yeah. So what it is not is sleep. Um, obviously, based on all these things, you're pretty much as close as you can get to death without crossing over the threshold. So you are pretty heavily monitored. Um, I don't know if you can see it very well. OK, yeah. So this right here is an a electroencephalogram. It measures the amount of brain activity that's going on. So the deeper into the anesthesia, you can see at the very bottom there is like a flat line. That's essentially what you would see in somebody who's brain dead um, versus like somebody who has a little bit of anesthesia at the top and deeper as you go down. Uh, that middle one right there at about a, a biz of 20, where you see the burst, that's uh, like just like very small burst of um, brain activity, but it's not, it's, it's followed by longer amounts of non-activity. Uh, versus when you're without anesthesia here, even when you're in a very deep sleep, you can see that you're still having some pretty uh, high brain waves. So you're still having quite a bit of activity. So it's a lot different than sleep, although it's really difficult to explain to people that it's a medication-induced reversible coma. So you just tell them that you're going to put them to sleep. Plus, it's, I think, a lot less scary. So um, one of the main things about anesthesia, one of the main things about anesthesia is that because they're not, they're paralyzed, they're, they're unable to breathe on their own. And so like my classmate here talked about earlier, when you're breathing normally, it's like a negative pressure type system. Your diaphragm pushes down and your, your ribs, uh, intercostal muscles push your ribs out. And so that causes a pressure gradient and the, the air goes from a higher pressure to a lower pressure um, in, into your lungs there, but when you're ventilating somebody on the ventilator, um, you're breathing for them, you're more pushing the air in, so that it just changes the way it affects your body. It allows the surgeons to do things without your other muscles getting in the way. Um, so usually they have to, um, oh, so that's just kind of talking about the negative pressure and positive pressure there, the differences. Usually they, sometimes they use something like this if it's like a little kid or you just don't want to do something super invasive or if you're going for like a colonoscopy or something that's going to be very quick like that, but typically they don't do that too much. These are kind of a little bit more common. Um, you still these like in emergency type situations where people's uh, airway can't really remain open on its own, so um, not necessarily for anesthesia, but sometimes. But usually what you see is endotracheal tube or um, a LMA, which is I think a laryngeal mask airway. Um, with the main difference with the uh, ET tube at the top is it goes all the way down into your trachea um, and blocks off the air completely so the air can only go in and out of your lungs versus the LMA. Can, sometimes you can get some uh, secretions that come up through your belly and esophagus and end up in your lungs and that could cause you problems. Um, so also I wanted to kind of talk about the, uh, the drugs and stuff. Um, usually the, they tr they're trying to kind of veer away from using gases because a lot of the medications you use, they're more IV, you, there's like reversibles for them, but the gases, you just pretty much have to breathe them off over time. Before anesthesia, people just basically got held down and they just cut into people and just went to town. But then I believe it was um, in dentistry, they actually 
uh, found out about nitrous or diethyl ether, I think it was, and then they went into nitrous. And anyway, uh, so the gases that they usually use now are nitrous oxide, sevofluorine, uh, desofluorine, and isofluorine. But usually it's the nitrous and the sevofluorine because those the nitrous comes on quick and comes off pretty quick, and the sevofluorine is kind of like a middle ground. The other two can kind of last for a really long time, and since there's aren't there aren't any drugs to reverse those, then you're pretty much just waiting for them to wear off. This is what a typical anesthesia machine looks like. Uh, I did some shadowing with some uh, CRNAs and anesthesiologists, and um, you can see that the, those are the gases up there in the upper right-hand corner, and that's the bellow that they use to ventilate when they want to manually ventilate you. And it hook, you can't really see it in this picture, but it hooks up to the breathing tube that you would have at that time. Um, and so this is what I was talking about, where they're trying to kind of move more towards like total IV anesthesia. Um, and so they use propofol, um, which is uh, Diprovan, which is the drug Michael Jackson had some issues with, uh, Presidex, Atominate, Versed. Um, most, I think most of those drugs, except for propofol, have like a reversal, but propofol comes off really, really quick. So usually, as long as you just give it time, it'll, it'll come off pretty quickly. And then also the paralytics. So typically where I work at in the trauma ICU, we usually go from somebody breathing on their own to us needing to breathe for them pretty quickly. So we usually use uh, succinylcholine because the onset is very quick. And in the event they're not able to get a breathing tube in quick enough, then um, it comes off pretty quick in 10 minutes and that person can kind of start breathing on their own so you're not breathing for them with like a bag for 35 minutes if you were to use rocaronium. The only time we really use that is if we're gonna paralyze a patient for like days. Um, and then the electricity involved. Uh, so the, um, as a part of the monitoring, it's important to kind of know what the heart is doing as you're in anesthesia. It can have quite a bit of effects on your heart. So uh, the, there, you're constantly monitored by EKG. Um, which is really uh, like a galvanometer, but it's kind of turned on its side where basically the leads have positive and negative spots in your body and you're measuring the uh, electricity of the heart coming maybe away from a specific lead or towards a specific lead and that kind of can tell you if there's damage in that part of the, the heart muscle. So um, this is a picture of like one of the first EEG, EKGs where they basically had you in some salt water on both of your hands and one leg, and they had that galvanometer, which kind of is turned to its side. So if you can imagine this turned to its side and then the paper kind of coming across it, and that's uh, reading off of the heart's electricity, and that kind of tells you like which direction that the um, electricity is flowing and if you're having any problems based on that direction. So it's gotten very specific. Um, in advance, I would say, but it's a very simple concept. And so this is just kind of like what the perfect EKG rhythm would look like. And when you put all the leads on, it gives you uh, like a three-dimensional view of the heart. Like, you know, like say if you're in a car accident, you want to be able to see all sides of the car to kind of know where the problem is. You're not going to be able to see everything from the back or everything from the front. So the leads are in different parts of the body, and it basically gives you that 3D image. It's this image, but it's based off of where the leads are placed. And once you kind of learn which lead is representative of which portion of the heart, then you can kind of see, okay, this person had an issue with maybe their anterior portion of their heart or maybe their posterior portion of the heart, just depending. Um, and then, oh, I wanted to, uh, I don't know if this video is gonna work, but I kind of just wanted to um, show you like a small video uh, of what happens in doing, emergency man? situations. Okay. Um, but I don't think. Johnny. Okay. So sometimes everything doesn't go great, and you kind of have to wake the heart up. Sorry, man. You're done. All done. It hurts a lot. <laughs> um, but what I wanted to kind of to bring it back to physics is that basically you're giving them anywhere between 150 and 360 joules, and that is coming across that point. Uh, 004 seconds, which if you do the math is uh, somewhere near 50 to 120 horsepower. So it's literally like getting kicked by a few horses, to say the least. How are you doing, man? Um, and so lastly, I kind of just wanted to talk about hemodynamics. Um, 
So I don't know how many of you guys are in biology, but you know the blood comes in basically through the right side of the heart and then uh, comes into the right ventricle over to the lungs, get oxygenated back into the left side of the heart and then out through the, the, the aorta from the left ventricle. Um, and the reason why I brought that up is because I was uh, doing a little bit of research and kind of learned that there's some similarities and some comparisons that they teach you about later on uh, between Ohm's law and this uh, map over, or map equals cardiac output times SVR. Basically, what all of that means is that um, just as in a circuit, how if you increase your uh, resistance, you're gonna need more um, voltage to maintain that, that same current. Uh, over here, if you increase your SVR, you're gonna have to, it's gonna change the way your map is. No, understanding the, the physics of how that flows um, kind of helps you to be able to know, okay, well, maybe I want to give a medication that increases your systemic vascular resistance, or maybe I want to give you a medication that brings up your cardiac output, or maybe I want to give you a medication that brings down your MAP. Um, and that, that mean arterial pressure is what you're really trying to control, because that's basically giving you enough blood to um, perfuse your organs, your vital organs. So. Um, and that's mostly it. Uh, the other thing is just that we're trying to, um, or they're trying to come away from using as many, using as much narcotics because that's having with a opiate epidemic right now. The big push is to try to get away from using as much narcotics. So a lot of research is going into maybe like using like warming people up faster to help them um, have less pain, to need less pain meds, to get out of the hospital sooner, and not end up with quite as many payments. So uh, that's it. Yeah. Questions? Yes? You talked about brain activity with levels of anesthesia. Yeah. Does that change? So, for example, let's say someone is under anesthesia just 30 minutes in an easy procedure versus two hours, but if they're at the same plane, does it affect it for the amount of time? Right. So, the. Um, the way you adjust that is with the amount of gas or medication that you're giving. So for some procedures like a colonoscopy, you really don't need them to be in quite as deep of a, uh, a as anesthesia. So you're going to keep their, I don't have it up there, but their, their biz number quite a bit on the higher side. Uh, if you're doing like a total um, cardiac bypass surgery where you're going to essentially stop the heart, you don't want them to move at all. So you're uh, putting their sedation a lot deeper. It's not so much uh, how long they are, it's how high you're turning up the, 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 either the gas or the anesthesia, whether it be gas or IV. It's the dosing that you do, because usually you're dosing like, um, so for like IV medication, you're giving like so many micrograms per kilogram of the patient per minute. Or if you're doing gases, you're turning up the percentage of the gas that's in the, the ventilated system. So it might be instead of 1% of sevoflurane, it might be 3% to get them in a deeper state of anesthesia. Any other questions? OK, go ahead. One, one more question. So That's fine. So I work in veterinary medicine. We use isofluorine because it's cheap. OK. And is it, with human medicine, do they ever mix, when you're using gases, do they ever mix any of the gases? They do. So a lot of times, um, they, they mix nitric, uh, they make ni nitric oxide and sevoflurane, but they try to kind of do them like this so that they're not using them necessarily both at the same time but they a lot of times at least when I was shadowing the CRNAs they would have like a little bit of of uh, two different medications and even sometimes the IV medication on top of that yes um, you 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 can help that that helps because it changes the percentage but really what helps is like turning up the respiration rate on the ventilator to just breathe it off faster um, because it's once it's in your lungs then it's absorbed into your body so I mean you're not giving them any more so that helps but what help but what solves the problem is just breathing it off yes Say it again. Yes. Correct. The gases are percentage of total airflow going into the patient. So, like, uh, yeah. So. so. Right. So, 
Um, the, the stats on that are pretty low, um, less than half a percent, but what, what could possibly happen is everybody handles medications differently. Like I'm a pretty big guy, so I might need more medication than like a smaller person. Plus to certain genetics, like certain redheads need more medication. If you're like older, you need um, less medication to get you at a certain state. If you're a baby, you need the most medication per weight to get you at a certain um, anesthetic level. So um, I think it's just basically if you have a miscalculation of that. but. Now they have what's called a, um, a, a MAC score, and so they're able to monitor that, and they're able to monitor your uh, amount of muscle movement by checking like your, they basically put, attach these two electrodes and shock your body and see how often you twitch uh, these involuntary muscles. And so based on that and your MAC score, they, have, they could do a much better job of making sure that you're not close to waking up. Any other questions there? All right, thank you for your time.